and welcome to Drive with the DW Car Show. Coming up, three drive systems for the Hyundai Ioniq. We test the hybrid version. Porsche on Quest for a record at the Nürburgring. And the new Mercedes S-Class. Car tester Sasha Knapp wouldn't say the Mercedes S-Class actually needed a facelift, even after four years. But if it's going to keep its benchmark status, it has to keep its technology state-of-the-art. From the outside, the facelift is not readily apparent. But a closer look at the grille and the bumper reveals slight differences. The real improvements are under the hood. Sasha points out that traditionally, the S500 had always had a V8. Now it's powered by an inline six-cylinder engine. He wonders how the car's fans will receive it. Should the S500 have really had a V8? He'll check out the performance and sound to decide for himself. The 320 kilowatt output of the 3 liter inline six does come close to that of the 4.7 liter V8 used up to now, but it needs a good sized turbocharger to do it. That builds exhaust gas pressure in the lower rev range. So Mercedes has given its R6 an electric booster compressor. It kicks in right from the rock bottom rev range, giving the engine a good 520 Newton meters of torque at just 1800 revs before the turbocharger takes over. And that's the end of turbo lag. An integrated starter generator sandwiched between engine and transmission spurs on the gasoline engine the moment the car's rolling. Sasha explains that since it takes a lot of fuel to set this nearly two-ton street cruiser in motion, the electric boost can help reduce fuel consumption by a good 22 percent. Among the fuel-saving tweaks is the coasting function, and the driver won't be called upon to switch off the eco start-stop system, as the starter generator is always at the ready. Never has saving fuel been this fun. The electric drive also supplies the 48-volt electrical system. Recuperative braking helps to charge the battery, which is stowed under the rear seats. The primary electrics also supply the windshield heating, taking it to the right temperature faster, and the air conditioning keeps running when the car is standing still. Personally, Sasha quite likes the inline six-cylinder engine. He's pleasantly surprised, especially by the electric motor. But to make a real comparison, he'll have to drive the V8 version, like this S560. He'll be interested to see how much of a difference to the inline six he'll be able to feel. Sasha likes the sound much better when he steps on the gas in the S560. It has better pickup as well. Now he finds the difference greater than he's expected at first. He realizes the inline six just can't measure up to the V8. When he considers only the specs, the difference seems to be greater subjectively than objectively. The S500's starter generator can briefly give the combustion engine up to 250 newton meters of torque and 16 kilowatts of additional power. The interior has a very high class feel to it, whether in front or back. The spaciousness and fine materials create an atmosphere of elegance. To enhance the wellness factor of its luxury class even further, Mercedes has given it an ambient lighting system capable of 64 colors with individually adjustable zones. The only space for Sasha in an S-Class is behind the wheel, but not all S-Class buyers have to or want to drive it themselves, so it's important to make sure it has plenty of room in back. His 1.92 meter frame has more than enough space. Even with four people in the car, his knees don't bump into the seat in front. But should any more room be needed, the front seat can be moved forward from the rear to create the kind of legroom offered by business class airplane seats. 
Richtig viel Beinfreiheit. To experience real luxury, all that's needed in the S-Class is the remote control to switch on the energizing comfort program. It presents a selection of music, fragrance, and hot stone massage for a well-tempered atmosphere of wellness. The lighting is a part of it. Passengers in back can be prodded and caressed to their desired state of vitality. It can make all the difference on long hauls or heading to this or that important meeting. But personally, Sasha doesn't feel that he needs it, especially since the combinations of options don't come cheap. The price list has the energizing comfort at just 238 euros, but the relatively low extra charge only comes together with more expensive extras like the ambient lighting for 476 euros and the air balance package for 440 euros. The extras really start adding up with the active multi-contour front and rear seats, including a massage function for just over 2,000 and just over 1,850 euros respectively. Sasha returns to the question, does an S500 have to have a V8? He wouldn't say so. The inline six-cylinder engine with electric drive would definitely be enough for him. But for the sound and prestige of a V8, a car buyer will have to go for the S560. The S-Class starts at 85,000 euros in Germany, and the S500 lists for 103,000. A V8 engine will tack another 10,000 euros onto that. And if you want to go right to the limits, you can try out the AMG S65 with a price tag of some 240,000 euros. But that's another story entirely. With the Leon Cupra ST, Seat is now offering a sporty station wagon meant to combine practical family needs and the race car feel. How does it do? Car tester Emanuel Schaefer takes it for a spin on Austria's Wachau ring. He's interested to see how long it will take this car to convince him. At a length of some 4.55 meters, it already gets points for roominess, but we'll get to that later. Now we'll take it for a spin on the racetrack. With a 221 kilowatt output, the all-wheel drive makes the spring from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in under 5 seconds, with a top speed of 250 kilometers per hour. Even our tester is impressed by those figures. His verdict? Driving the Cupra on a racetrack is a lot of fun. The all-wheel drive really helps with acceleration out of the curves. <laughs> so it's clearly fun to drive. That's no wonder, since the adaptive chassis control reacts to road conditions within milliseconds. This station wagon stays true to the design standards of the Leon series, looking quite similar to its tamer siblings. But a few small details reveal what's hiding underneath. The performance package options include Brembo brakes for the right amount of deceleration. 19-inch alloy wheels underscore its sporty character. As do the spoiler. And the dual exhaust pipes. In the interior, sports seats provide the right support. The Cupra logo is embossed on the integrated headrests. And how does it stack up on space? Yeah. Emmanuel says there's definitely enough room to sit comfortably, even over long journeys. The seats are comfortable and there's plenty of headroom. The rest of the interior makes a tidy impression, since most of the functions are controlled by a touchscreen, with the exception of the air conditioning settings, which is a good thing. The trunk offers a generous 587 liters of cargo space.
The Leon ST Cupra 300 starts at 35,780 euros in Germany. Summing up, Imanuo says this car delivers on its promise as a roomy family car with the engine power of a race car. It's convinced him that it's truly the best of both worlds. After just three years, BMW is giving its 2 Series a facelift. BMW traditionally calls this modernization life cycle impulse. In the case of the 2 Series, this impulse is gentle. The standard by LED headlamps have a new design that is a little closer to the traditional kidney shape. The 2 Series convertible starts at 34,200 euros in Germany. Rolls-Royce presents the eighth generation of the luxury sedan, the Phantom. The architecture of luxury is an aluminum space frame and is slated to be the foundation of all future Rolls-Royce models. The British flagship manufacturer is powered by a 12-cylinder engine with 420 kilowatts and 900 newton meters of torque. The ZF transmission has eight speeds. <laughs> Car tester Ronnie Levstek is presenting the Hyundai Ionic, which is available with three drivetrains, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and all-electric. Today, he's testing the hybrid version to see if it can compete with the likes of the Toyota Prius. The nameplate Ionic is a portmanteau of ion, an electrically charged particle, and unique. And what is unique is the selection of powertrains for this model. The Hyundai Ionic Hybrid's highly aerodynamic design is certainly praiseworthy. Its coupe-style profile bears certain similarities to the familiar hybrid models by Toyota and Honda. But where the South Korean car really sets itself apart, to its advantage, is in the details. The Hyundai Ionic shares its powertrain with the Kia Niro. The integrated rear spoiler helps with the aerodynamics, but can get in the way of a clear view when reversing or maneuvering. Luckily, a backup camera is standard. At a length of 4.47 meters, the five-seater offers plenty of room. The back seat is comfortable even for adults. The trunk offers 443 liters of space, expandable to 1,505 liters when you fold down the back seat. But the loading sill is impractical, sitting 76 centimeters above the ground and rising an ungainly 21 centimeters above the bed. Ronnie Levstek says the front sight lines are good despite the flat windshield, but the split rear view window hinders the view and back, the price of a good drag coefficient value. The hybrid has a 1.6-liter gasoline direct injection engine that provides 77 kilowatts of power and an electric motor with 32 kilowatts. The total system output is 104 kilowatts with a maximum torque of 265 newton meters. The manufacturer claims it'll go 100 kilometers on 3.9 liters of gas. Ronnie says it's not a sports car, though the test car's tuning suggests the engineers were hoping for more power. It can jolt unpleasantly over bumps, and although the seats are comfortable, they're thinly upholstered, and you feel those bumps. The interior is clear-cut. The front seats are sufficiently contoured, though the sides could be more defined in the shoulder region. Most of the controls are placed where you'd expect to find them, and the main display is at a nearly optimal height. The audio system and SD navigation system are standard. The AC controls consist of clear, large buttons, but the position is a bit low. The style and premium packages offer the option of inductive smartphone charging. The Hyundai Ionic Hybrid is going after the hybrid pioneer, the Toyota Prius. It has more agile handling and a dual-clutch automatic transmission. It also avoids polarizing aesthetics and costs about 5,000 euros less. 
Ronnie sums things up by saying that the Hyundai Ionic will appeal to environmentally minded city drivers who like wedge shapes. It offers extensive features and fuel efficiency, but drivers shouldn't expect it to set their hearts on fire. When it comes to testing both race cars and street legal cars, there's a benchmark that all car makers base things on the north loop of the Nürburgring racetrack. It's nearly 21 kilometers long, with 73 curves and more than 300 meters of elevation change. Car makers run tests here and try to break records. It's just the right track for Porsche's newest road vehicle, the 911 GT3 with 368 kilowatts of power. Frank Valiza from Porsche says the best car is the one that covers the distance in the shortest time. He says that if you're fast enough on the Nürburgring, you'll be fast enough anywhere in the world. But the North Loop is different from most race courses, since it features a challenging, variable driving surface. Posting a good time on this track means a huge boost to your image. The North Loop puts a considerable strain on tires. So to get the best time, Porsche changes the tires after each lap. Frank Valiza explains that to set records, preparation has to be perfect. The tires have to be there. Everything has to have been carefully planned, and the drivers have to have practiced. The weather has to cooperate, and the team has to be highly motivated. After months of meticulous preparation, everything is focused on just a few minutes, when everything has to work perfectly. Porsche is using tires their customers will also get on their GT3. They're sporty, semi-slicks made specifically for the GT3. Andreas Poininger from Porsche says the main thing is drivability. On the North Loop in particular, the driver has to trust the vehicle, getting feedback from the car, and be able to anticipate its reactions. That's the only way to get the car to the limit and reach top speeds. A lot of power or great tires aren't enough. Everything has to be well matched to achieve the absolute optimal result. The clock is ticking. Now everything has to be just right. Only the best of the best manage to stay below seven minutes and 20 seconds on a lap of the North Loop. And among those is the new GT3. It manages a lap time of seven minutes, 12 seconds and seven tenths. The engineers are thrilled with the results of their hard work. Race car driver Lars Kern says he felt relaxed driving the car. It responded well, and he didn't have any critical moments during the two laps. He says they knew the car had the potential to make that time, and he says it's important for it to be easy for the customer to experience. He thinks that won't be a problem. Porsche proved its mettle on the North Loop back in 2013 with its super sports car, the 918 Spider. The company was the first to post a North Loop lap time of under seven minutes with a series production street legal vehicle. This time, another 918 is being put to the test. And Porsche easily confirms the potential of its radical hybrid with a lap time of 6 minutes and 58 seconds. Of course, not every Porsche customer will be in a position to achieve times like that. Still, every driver profits from a car that handles smoothly, even at top speeds.
In the 1950s, the Opel Kapitän was among the German automotive industry's best sellers. It offered executive class comfort at an affordable price. That was Opel's concept and recipe for success, and it secured the Kapitän third place among Germany's new car registrations. After its little brother, the Opel Olympia Record and the VW Beetle. As car tester Christoph Bauer tells us, Opel's history goes all the way back to 1862 when Adam Opel founded a sewing machine and bicycle manufacturer. In 1899, he started turning out automobiles, which led to an burgeoning economic expansion. By the late 1920s, Opel had a market share of 44 percent, making it Germany's largest car maker. Then came the Great Depression, and in 1929, America's General Motors bought out Opel. But that didn't slow down its business success one bit. In the 1930s, Opel rolled upward and onward to become the biggest car maker in Europe, excelling with such technological innovations as the self-supporting unibody. Starting in 1938, following the Opel Olympia and the Cadet, the first Capitaine also made use of this modern design. The six-cylinder sedan continued almost unchanged right through the World War II until 1953. Then it was time to find a successor. Just as in the pre-war years, the Capitaine of the 1950s quickly secured its place as the best-selling German six-cylinder car. In three years of production, this version alone found exactly 92,555 buyers. Christoph points out that every square centimeter of this modern ponton styling reveals the influence of the American parent General Motors. Lots of chrome, lots of shine. At the time, an absolute must-have. That includes the wraparound panoramic windshield, the obligatory tail fins, and the often rather garish two-tone paint job. Compared to some of its peers, this model is fairly modest. Opel took on another trend from the United States, and just six years from 1950, 53 to 59, the factory rolled out four different Capitaine models. Not until the 1960s did Opel give up this rather cash-intensive trend for facelifts. This 1955 version of the Capitaine differs from its predecessor in the flattened hood, the oval grille, and the larger tail fins. And its successor sported a windshield that wrapped all the way around to the doors even more and shinier chrome and even bigger tail fins. An additional 900 Deutschmarks would buy a luxury version with separate front seats, an imitation leather dash, a makeup mirror, and lots of styling. Christoph points out the one constant with all the 1950s Capitaines, a very quiet but very robust inline six-cylinder, two-and-a-half-liter engine. It had powered the Opel Blitz, and it sucked in fuel and air through only one carburetor. That tended to limit performance. By 3,900 revs, it had already reached its maximum output, but it was the torque that gave the car its pickup, an impressive 170 newton meters. That kicked in at just 1,700 revs and made for a very decent acceleration. The three-speed transmission with a steering column mounted gear shift was made for the shiftless driver and a very casual driving style. Fuel consumption averaged about 11.5 liters. Not at all bad for the time. In 1970, after long and dependable service, the Capitain was retired with honors. From then on, the top of the range belonged to the Admiral and the Diplomat, while the up-and-coming Opel Commodore served the mid-range. 
Christoph concludes that for over 30 years, the Opel Capitaine served well and admirably. Nearly half a million were built. Before the war, it was a technological innovator that set new standards with itself supporting all steel body. In the 1950s, the new generation Capitaines became darlings of the rising middle class and symbols of West Germany's economic miracle. As the best-selling six-cylinder of its time, the Opel Capitaine was doubtlessly a milestone of automotive history. In the 1980s, Opel gave up the Navy-based naming tradition for its Opel models, names like Cadet, Commodore, and Admiral, a tradition that had actually begun with the Opel Capitaine. Next time on Drive It, sportier and bigger, the new Ford Fiesta. And the Mercedes-AMG GTC, a dream of a luxury sport convertible. <laughs>